Okay. Um, as I said, he's made a number of uh, films in the 1920s. He was also still active in the 1930s, but making completely different movies. Um, but in the 1920s, he was very much inspired by the revolution, and all his films are uh, about revolutionary uh, subjects. Um, the Strike, Battleship Pachonkin is probably the most quoted and um, yeah, his best known film. Uh, October, from which I'm going to show you a, a small clip. Um, and in general, these innovative films in the 1920s, not only from Eisenstein, but from other people working in that direction as well, um, you know, reveal a revolutionary subject matter. So they are about strikes, about mutinies, about revolts, about people, the masses, uh, uh, revolting. Um, usually it does not involve, uh, involve uh, professional actors, uh, because there is also not, not a leading role. You know, the main character, the main hero, is the masses. Right? So this is very much uh, in line with the uh, idea of the 1920s. Um, experimental, intellectual montage, as I said. Um, and this makes it a bit, bit for the uh, most you know, uh, cultural officials, especially toward the late 1920s, um, it was um, perceived as difficult and incomprehensible. Um, and this is why this, this innovative approach, this intellectual montage, um, why it became increasingly marginalized. Um, but that's a different story. Now, I won't play a clip from October, which I think some of you have already watched. Um, and I have a question for you. Because um, what intellectual montage is um, trying to create is... Uh, create a new uh, abstract idea that is not present in one single shot. So my question to you is, what is the abstract idea that's being created in the following episode from October? Let's see if I can... <coughs> What we see here is Alexander Kielinski, um, the head of the provisional government, who was then ousted in October 1917 by the Bolsheviks. And Kielinski uh, has gone down in history as a very... He's gone down in history as a very ineffective politician, uh, and a very uh, a, a man who was mostly, you know, interested in improving his own position, but not the true revolutionary uh, that some people uh, took him for. And now he's entering the Winter Palace, you know, where the Tsar used to live before the revolution. And it's clear that Kierinsky is you know, imagine himself to be a, a new emperor or something like that. And what you see here is a, is a famous clock, which is in Hermitage, in the Winter Palace, a clock in the form of a peacock. And every hour, it sets up its, its uh, wings, its feathers. So it is a marvelous uh, thing to, to watch. question to you is, I mean, we've seen another example of this intellectual montage, and what, what, is it, what is the abstract idea that this scene is trying to convey? Does anyone have a clue? So we have Kierinsky, we have a peacock, um, and what is absent? 
I think, but which is also there in this scene, is a statue of Napoleon. So we have three elements. What is the abstract idea? I mean, what do they have in common? Kierensky, Napoleon, and the, and the peacock. What does a peacock signify? Pride. Pride, yes. Pride, or rather vanity. Right? So this is, um, you know, these are the three building blocks of this particular scene. And here you have a close-up of that, that marvelous uh, uh, clock. Okay. Um, to speed up things a little, um, I'll now switch to uh, documentary film and the influence of, um, of constructivism in, uh, in art. I'm sure you're familiar with Vladimir Kotlin's Monument to the Third International, which was never realized. Um, there's some interesting Soviet sky fi from the 1920s using uh, constructivist uh, costumes and sets. Um, and, you know, generally speaking, constructivism was a sort of an anti-art form. Um, it was clearly uh, intended to serve the uh, revolution um, and to help to establish the um, socialist way of life. Um, but ironically speaking, um, constructivists uh, actually denied art as an autonomous activity. Art should serve the revolution, should serve the people, and this is why constructivism is mainly about applied art, right? Industrial design, architecture, um, and in terms of film and literature, there was a huge skepticism towards the traditional forms of film, feature film, and literature that is fictional novels, fictional stories. Um, newspapers, uh, news reporting, news reels, um, uh, literatura facta, literature of facts. I mean, that was the new art form uh, to which the future belonged. Um, and I think Zygavietov, you know, the most radical of all these directors, um, you know, went uh, furthest with this. Um, and I hope I can show you a clip of that as well. Now, he was not alone. Uh, we see Eskir Shub, um, mainly known for the documentary The Fall of the Roman of the, uh, Dynasty from 1927. Uh, and the interesting thing about it, this is that there was nothing um, staged, there was nothing acted or um, you know, new footage shot. It was completely based on a montage of footage that already existed. Before the uh, and was shot before the revolution. And what it tries to achieve is to convey the message that what actually happened, you know, inevitably led to the October Revolution. So she's not inventing anything, but she is using documentary footage from before the revolution, you know, which suggests, you know, that this is actually what happened. That she is conveying the truth. And, uh, well, since Sergei Losnitsa was brought up, Sergei Losnitsa made fictional films, uh, feature movies, but uh, documentary films as well. You know, and there's a, the legacy of these documentary makers of the 1920s and their influence on what Sergei Losnitsa is doing with Maidan and other recent films. I mean, that is beyond any doubt. And I think Sergei Rosnitsa would very much uh, you know, acknowledge that, that he's working in that tradition of working with existing footage. Okay, Gertov, um, which is, by the way, a pseudonym, uh, his actual name was Kaufman. Um, he kind of remembers how he came to his a drastic approach to filmmaking, to documentary filmmaking. Um, this is how he describes just wandering through the city and the numerous impressions that, uh, that reach him. One day in the spring of 1918, I was returning from the railway station. In my ears there remained the chugs and bursts of steam from a departing train. 
someone swearing, a kiss, somebody's exclamation, laughter, a whistle, voices, the ringing of the station bell, the puffing of a locomotive, whispers, shouts, farewells. There is a need to find a machine not only to describe, but to register, to photograph these sounds, perhaps a camera. So he's exposing himself to very different impressions, sounds coming towards him. You know, and he's looking for a way to register those sounds and to, to, uh, to articulate them in a coherent way. Um, he actually experimented with sound um, uh, with uh, recordings, uh, but then he switched to uh, to film. He made some, uh, especially news reels in the beginning of the uh, of the 1920s. Um, but already um, in 1922, 1923, he also asserted himself as a director with very outspoken ideas on the new cinema. So, Rieto, as I said, you know, was the most outspoken, iconic class of these revolutionary innovators. Um, and he thought that film, as Russia knew it, was simply obsolete and outdated. And this is from one of his many articles, manifest, manifesto-like uh, articles that he produced in the 1920s. So we declare the old films, the romantic, the theatralized, to be leprous. We affirm the future of cinema art by rejecting its present. The death of cinematography is necessary so that the art of cinema may live. Um, well, and then he goes on for a uh, number of pages. Um, but he also wrote an introduction to uh, one of his most outspoken films, a documentary, you know, that contains mostly seemingly haphazard charts of everyday life. Um, and he very much believed in the superiority of the camera for registering um, life as it really is, as opposed you know, to the human eye, as opposed to traditional filmmaking, you know, which was telling which was about telling romantic uh, stories. So, our eye sees very badly, and very little. And so people invented the microscope in order to see invisible phenomena. And so people invented the telescope in order to see and study distant worlds. And so people invented the movie camera in order to penetrate more deeply into the seen world, in order to study and note down visual phenomena, in order not to forget what is happening. So, the movie camera is capable of capturing, you know, a certain deeper essence in reality that escapes us, as when we only rely on our, uh, on our eyes. And, you know, this is probably Vieta's most uh, famous um, um, adage, life caught unaware. Which means that um, you try to capture life as it really is, as it unfolds before your camera. So there's no scripts, no subtitles or intertitles in the 1920s to tell a story. Um, it's showing life as it really is. At least that is the pretension. Um, and as a good constructivist, Vieta was convinced that art, traditional art, would simply disappear. And that art, in the traditional sense, you know, is simply not in line with the revolutionary agenda of the new regime. Man with a movie camera is you know, his most famous documentary. Um, it has some similarities with things happening in Germany, especially with Walter Ruttmann's The Symphony of a Great City, which registers life in Berlin, if I'm not mistaken, you know, from dusk to dawn, 24 hours, um, which is a sort of a eulogy to life in the great city. Um, but in Werther's case, it's not uh, any city in particular, because the film was shot in, uh, in Kiev, in Kharkiv, and in Moscow, 
Um, but it's a very politically engaged film, a political statement on the future of art, or rather the death of art. Uh, and that is kind of summed up in the closing scene of the, uh, the closing montage of the film, where we see the Bolshoi the Theater, uh, the famous Bolshoi Theater of Moscow, collapsing, you know, which symbolizes the, uh, the, the doomedness of yesterday's art. Um, now, I had some things to say on the way he, the, the montage that he uses, I think I'll just uh, concentrate on one. Um, there is a, uh, an interesting uh, opposition in the film of, you know, frivolous and productive activities. And this is Vietov um, being very critical of this new economic policy of uh, Vladimir Lenin, uh, who kind of reintroduced entrepreneurship. Many outspoken communists were opposed to that because that was, you know, bringing back in capitalism. And Vietov was one of them. So, uh, the clip that I'm going to play, that's the last one, um, we see several activities, some of them productive, but some of them improductive, of people living it up, um, forgetting about the revolutionary ideals. So, if you see this film for the first time, you would never understand that Ryabdov is trying to convey these messages. It's a very complicated form of intellectual montage, um, but now that you know, perhaps you can actually understand it. So I have to move to um, YouTube. So the whole film is punctuated with uh, shots of the cameraman. Therefore, this is uh, not only a film about capturing life as it really is, but it's also a film about the superiority of the medium, not of, of film as an art form, but of the medium film. These are actually the hands of Vietnam's wife, who was the editor of the film. So we see, we see people being productive, suing, or editing a film, and other people not being productive, having their nails polished. social contradictions which were supposed to disappear from socialist uh, from socialist society um, but you know we're supposed to think that these are just vestiges traces of the old pre-revolutionary way of life that is about to disappear um, the film 
you know, is very much hardcore communist, if you will. Uh, but it was banned. It was shelved immediately after its release. Uh, it did very well at the box office uh, abroad, but not in Russia, because the film was simply consider, considered to be too complicated for the mass, for the, the big audience, uh, which led to a marginalization of Yerkov. He continued to make some films, but he made a serious faux pas in 1934, a sort of a eulogy on Lenin, but not referring to Stalin, uh, you know, which was a huge mistake. So um, he was not arrested or uh, prosecuted or anything, uh, but he, his career sort of petered out, um, and he became very much a marginalized director. So this is my last slide. I mean, is or can we conceive of, of Russian film, you know, as the most important of all arts, as uh, Lenin, uh, you know, promised uh, his supporters? The interesting thing is, I think, uh, that um, the 1920s were indeed the golden age of, of Russian cinema, uh, because things are rapidly changing toward the end of the 1920s. Um, there is a, uh, you know, people, cultural officials, uh, politicians insist on a more accessible form of filmmaking without the intellectual montage, uh, which simply tells a uh, straightforward story that, you know, any viewer can understand, uh, that also contains the right ideological message. Uh, because that is the irony of this, that most of these innovative directors did support the Bolshevik regime. But, you know, the, their revolutionary uh, ideas of how film should develop was simply at odds with the more conservative case of uh, Lenin and other um, uh, officials. So what happens in the 1930s is indeed a far more accessible sort of film um, that cuts down severely on montage. Montage is considered to be you know, something that distorts from the, from the storyline. Uh, so it's a more static, uh, a far more tame sort of cinema as compared to what we just saw uh, happening in the 1920s. 1930s is about historical films on national heroes, uh, military uh, officers, uh, composers, famous Russians, um, and musicals. Musicals which were not called musicals, but musical comedies, you know, to um, suggest that there was no influence from Hollywood at all, but at the same time, that influence was more than obvious. And Edison Stein actually went to Hollywood to uh, learn to make sound movies. And when he returned, he was assigned uh, to make a, uh, a musical, but he declined. Uh, even so, this was a tremendously successful job of musicals, you know, that showed life in the Soviet Union as if communist paradise had already uh, been realized. So I think I've taken enough of your time. Thank you for your attention. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm willing to take them, of course, but thanks for now.